Hey, what's up everyone? Um, I know it's been a long time since I released a video, but today I got a special guest here with me. I got Eric Shari. He's from Kenya, did mining engineering at UBC, and he's working out full time in the Canadian oil sands mining industry. Today, we're gonna dive into his background, his education, um, his work experiences as a co-op and his full-time work experience. And I know a lot of you guys are from outside of Canada and want to know how to work in Canada. So um, we're going to dive all into that. So first of all, Eric Shari, thank you so much for joining us today. Bless up, bro. Thanks for having me, man. So Eric, um, let, let's start all the way from the beginning. So you're from Kenya. Um, can you talk to me about, you know, what that experience was like? I imagine like there's a high school equivalent where you have to, you know, study really hard and then send your application to universities um, like around the world and UBC was one of them. Tell us about like what that experience was like of like applying to UBC from outside of Canada. Yeah, man. Um, like for me, my best friend was the internet and um, that's how, that's where I learned everything, man, because I'd never been to Canada before. So I was just going off the UBC website, seeing the pictures and, you know, like for me, when I was thinking about what to study, like why I came to UBC is just a couple of reasons. Um, the main one was mining. So I wanted to study mining. So when I was in high school, I was looking at things I wanted to study. I wanted to do engineering. When I was looking at what type of engineering, the most interesting to me was mining. So I was like, well, where can I study mining in the world? And Canada was one of the top options that I'd go for, you know, just mm -hmm. thinking out, you know, wildly, like if I could do this once, you know, go to a, uni yeah. you know, in university abroad while I'm alive, I was like either Canada or Australia. So, and then, um, did you consider like U of T or McGill? Um, I considered McGill. Um, I applied to McGill, U of A and UBC. Cause like at the same time, like, you know, application fees are expensive so you're not trying to apply it everywhere so those are the three i applied to and uh so i got into ubc and u of a and why i chose ubc i was actually about to choose u of a but i chose ubc just because of the better weather from what people were telling me so you know what i mean and that's what the internet said like you you know edmonton is one of the coldest places and vancouver is one of the least cold so that's why i chose ubc and then when I started looking into it, it's just going off, you know, the internet hearsay. And so it's a different experience if you've never been to the university. So for me, it was just like, I kind of trusted the process that if I filled in these application forms and I sent the money to this bank account that everything <laughs> will work out. <laughs> well, and it did. Would you say, um, like the information you found on the internet was was it like sufficient yeah well one thing i'd say is like the like the university website it's it's sufficient about the university but it's not really sufficient it's it's a good place to start i like to trust especially like forums where people talk yeah that's where i like to get you know they're the half of the story so you gotta look to all your sources you know what i mean you gotta if you find out someone who's been there or who has a brother or sister who's been there, you try and reach out and ask questions. So you don't rely on just one piece of information mm -hmm. for sure. You got to use everything and then you make a judgment call, you know? Um, so there's always pros and cons with everywhere. So it's not like, so if you only listen to one side of the story, you don't get the full story, right? So yeah. I know. But with all the info on the internet, it was all sufficient for me to, I'd never been there to prove it for myself, but it was sufficient, yeah. Yeah, and you didn't have like any like family or friends in Canada yet, right? No, well, my brother was in, in Canada at the time. He studied in Montreal and McGill. Okay. So, but, you know, and I had never been there before though. So from him, he'd tell me from his experience, he's been to Vancouver, Vancouver is better weather-wise mm -hmm. um you know he introduced me to some friends who had he actually had friends in ubc and i reached out and asked some questions uh he had friends in other you know universities and i asked them as well so you gotta okay. be proactive you know what i mean you don't want to like you know it's a big decision to leave your home country to go to a strange country yeah you can't you can't be taking chances out here man you just gotta so fortunately if you you everyone if you ask you can meet someone who knows what you're looking for so like 
you know, whether it's a, through a friend or a friend, if you ask, people will connect you to someone who can help you. So, yeah, you gotta be proactive, man. Yeah. That's definitely good advice. So when you first like landed in Canada, did you have to worry about housing, or did you find housing like before you even arrived in Canada? So like for me, I chose to go the safest way. The safest way is just to get housing through the uni. Mm-hmm. So that way they handled everything. So you just pay, and that was my plan. Like, and that's a lot of people's plan as well. You know, at least your first year you stay somewhere that you know you got to build familiarity so university is a safe space a safe space to start from you know what i mean and then as you get more confident you can start exploring wider and wider so like my first two years i chose to be in university then my third year i moved down um so when you're in university you don't worry about those kind of things They, they handle everything you know what i mean there's a system in place but when you decide to move off campus or stay you know in non university residence then you gotta worry about those kind of things when like mm-hmm. housing so that's a tougher way a lot of people do it first year you just leave off campus as well it's you know what i mean um it depends on your comfort zone to be honest but for me coming from an international like you know from living in my parents house i'm trying to go and live in the streets straight away like in a <laughs> in a strange country yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what i mean man i have i have no idea what to expect so i chose the safest was way. housing guaranteed for first year students? Yeah, housing is guaranteed for. I want to say housing is guaranteed for first year international students. Oh, okay. Domestic students is different, because um, I don't know if they can afford how ha- they can guarantee housing for all the students. But UBC mm. like increases has a lot of housing. Yeah. So I'd say for first year international students, I'd say it's definitely guaranteed. But then after first year, you know, they also understand that now second year is not guaranteed. Now you're you're on level playing with other people, right? Gotcha. So, yeah. So. Okay. So you came to yeah. Canada. You got housing figured out. Academics wise, um, w- was there any like adjustments you have to make in terms of like how you studied, um, how you approach courses? Because one, you're going from you know high school level or high school equivalent to university, and you're also doing it at a different country yeah yeah man that's a good question because yeah that's a fact man um like coming from kenya i had studied uh the british system right so mm-hmm. it's o level then a levels and even before that i had done the kenyan system before i I'd switched to british so i've been I've, I've actually changed like curriculum once before you know changing the curriculum systems before so coming to university was also a change in curriculum system, like how they teach and, you know, the course material, it's all like the course material might be the same, but how it's delivered is very different. Um, the number of exams, the number of tests, the, uh, you know, the projects that count as part of the coursework. Um, it was different, but one thing is I had at least some good preparation because I did A levels, which is like, grade 12 and 13 so like here in canada it reaches grade 12 then you go mm-hmm. to uni right yeah um in the u.s they call it correct me if i'm wrong is it ap level they, what do they call yeah, it yeah there's like, like ap 12? and there's like i did ib as well but yeah there's the, the ib AP system so you see ib is something i can relate to because that's ib1 and ib2 is like equivalent to like the british offering like grade 12 and 13 like oh, okay these are pre the 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 training the fundamentals for university so it's like pre-university right yeah um so that's the good thing with uh with those things um rather with that doing that part of the curriculum because you can go from grade 11 to university straight away but if you do like your a levels then you you get like a foundation to university so for me to be quite honest first year was a joke uh, I, I had too much fun, man. <laughs> I barely studied in first year, and I barely passed. So, <laughs> and if I didn't have grade twelve and thirteen, I would have even struggled more. I would have had to study hard because it would have been a huge change in yeah. learning. So honestly, like, and you know, a lot of people who uh, talk about going to university, people who ask me for advice, I say that like, you know. It's, 
spend like those one or two years doing like a pre-foundation courses, different, especially international students is what I mean. Um, and also like I, I got that advice from my brother and some of his friends. They did IB instead of going straight to uni. You know, you do IB or you do A levels. You get a foundation. It prepares you for that curriculum change. You mm-hmm. know, when you go international. Um, and yeah, so that's what I did. So for me, like honestly, I had too much fun in first year. I barely passed. But you know what? I wouldn't have had it any other way. Then second year, I became serious. Then I was like, okay, yo, yo, now you got to study, man. <laughs> you, you can't get away, like, with flukes, man. So second year, for sure, you know, pull up my socks and I did better. Third year, you know, even better and better. But, um, yeah, definitely, like, first year, almost kicked my ass, man. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Well, the results speak right, for yeah, A lot itself. of people didn't make it, but... <laughs> The result speaks for itself because you got like three internships. So let's jump into yeah, that. Yeah. Um, three yeah. mining internships. <laughs> the first one was at Tech. And what was that role that you had at Tech? So at Tech, I was um, eight month work term. Uh, I was a survey stu- I was a surveyor. Mm-hmm. So I was in the survey department, which is part of the, uh, the short range uh, mine department. So, you know, in tech, like the surveyors are employees of the company and they sit in the same offices as the engineers. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty much what I did for eight months. I was out in the field surveying, you know, um, was there any around like, the mine. Um, data processing that you had to do or was it just purely field work? Yeah, yeah there was data processing. Like um, when you go out to pick up uh, an as built, so we'd pick up as bills in two ways. Either you use, you know, your um, your total station, you know, and pick up toes and crests with, you know, laser shots. You know, I don't know if we get technical, but I can get really technical. But the other way was using 3D scanners, and you know, then this the lidar just does its thing and picks up the as built. Then you go to the office as the survey. It's your job now to translate that data from the survey instrument into now like uh, the CAD software for the engineers to use. So, you know, mm-hmm. CAD uh, deliverable files like DXFs and, you know, surface yeah. files. And uh, so were you at tech, like one of the coal operations or like Highland Valley? I was at uh, Fording River. So Fording River, that was okay. the, the largest uh, surface open pit uh, met coal mine they had, metallurgical coal. So it's the biggest in the valley, and it's right next to Green Hills. And you keep going down. You go to Sparwood. You get you come to Elk View, Line Creek. Um, so they have they're concentrated in the Elk Valley with these coal mines. And did you do your uh, term over the winter? Because I imagine if it was over the winter, it would have been really cold, right? That's a fact, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cold. <laughs> yeah, it was during the winter. I, I started in September and finished in April the next year. So I pretty much just got the end of the fall, September, October. Dude, by October, it's already winter. And so you go to October to April, it's just winter, man. By the time I was leaving, it was like kind of like uh, spring, but it's still cold. It, it was pretty winter. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it was winter when I left, man, end of April. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, a, it was also a new experience for me. Like, you know, as a one thing I say for co-op, um, people are different for me my motto was adventure you know i've already come all the way from kenya so far away what's a couple extra thousand kilometers man yeah. you know what i mean i was like well you know i might as well just go explore so when i was applying for jobs i was like whatever job i get i'll take it no excuses whatever man yeah. so some jobs i couldn't take for example because they needed a canadian driver's license mm-hmm. those are the only jobs i couldn't take really the ones that required either you got to speak French or yeah. <laughs> you need a Canadian driver's license. But any other job, I was like, I'll do it. So this one was, it, it, it was way outside of my comfort zone for sure. Um, and the cold was one factor. I'm like, man, I thought Vancouver was cold. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to escape the cold. Now I'm going to the coldest part of BC. Um, so, so it was good. You, you got that job, but didn't doesn't survey require you to drive like a pickup truck? Yeah, so that's the thing. On site, every mine, from what I've learned, from what my experience, and maybe others are different, 
but every mine site is private property. So in the mine, they have their own driving school. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't need an Alberta or a government stamp to certify you as a driver in the mine. In the mine, they train you themselves. If you pass the competency test, they issue you pretty much a driver's license. But just so, for the mine. For the mine, yeah. exactly. So that's why, I, and I had a driver's license. I had a Kenyan driver's license. I could prove that I can drive. I can drive, but I didn't have a Canadian mm. license. So, because um, I was still holding on to my Kenyan license. Now, after I graduated, uh, as a student, you can keep your your national country driver's license. But once you graduate and you're working, you have to um, transfer that to a Canadian license. And they do that by now taking and canceling your your international driver's license, your Kenyan license. So now I had to forsake that. So when I go to Kenya, now I have a Canadian driver's license. And I don't know if I'm allowed to drive there, but... Okay. I still end up drove, you know, driving. But <laughs> in a mine, it's different. It's it's their own property, even a haul truck. So I drove haul trucks as well. You know what I mean? Seven nine sevens, four hundred tonners, and I, I didn't have a Canadian license at the time, man. All you needed, actually, all you need is just to prove that you can drive. Yeah. And you can drive those big trucks as well. <laughs> so, um, yeah. To answer your question. Cool. So okay, yeah. You talked about adventure. So you went. You lived in BC or like Vancouver specifically, you went to the interiors and then for the next co-op term, you went to uh, Ontario, right? With Newmont. And how was that like? Yeah. It was a underground operation, I think. Yeah, that's right, bro. Um, it's actually before Newmont bought it, it was actually Gold Corp. Right. Gold Corp was a Canadian company, then Newmont bought that asset. Well, they bought Gold Corp and so they got that asset as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was there for eight months as well. It's in Northern Ontario. It's a town called Red Lake. Population a few thousand, um, unless I'm wrong. Um, I think it's in the tens of thousands, but I was staying in a smaller part of Red Lake called Balmer Town, which is where now the mine is, which is like 20 minutes away from the core of Red Lake, which is like, you know, it's it's kind of, there's people there, but in Balmer Town, there's less people, maybe mm -hmm. a couple thousand literally, if not less. But that's where the mine is. So, you know, people who live there are associated with the mine and uh, it's an underground gold mine. It's a very, it's, it, Red Lake has, it's one of Canada's most historic gold mines. I think it's a hundred and almost 50 years old today. Um, and they've been mining gold there for hundreds of, I mean, 150 years, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And they still have lots of gold to go. It's like a rich deposit, man. Um, so it's very historic they, and I worked there as, I went there as a project coordinator. That was, well, my, my, yeah, my job title was project coordinator. But when I got there, the projects I was supposed to be working on, I was working with the chief surveyor. So he was trialing a new way of capturing mine as builds, the underground gold mine. Um, and what he was trying to do, the project was pretty much just photogrammetry. So instead of using like your total stations and going down into the underground uh, caverns and now you're setting up tripods you're you know playing with your bubble to get it level and uh, you know what I mean you're putting on your total station you're warming it up you're going through the checklist and then before you even start doing the job then you gotta do the job then that whole process can take you up to 30 minutes and mining safety is the number one for many mines and for safe mining you gotta it has to be safe you get I mean yeah. for profitable mining forgive me it has to be safe you don't get away with like unsafe operations for a long term. So one of the safety objectives is to have people underground for as short time as possible. Mm -hmm. In fact, eliminate the need to go underground if you can. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so technology helps with that. So instead of now using total stations for setups, you just go with your GoPro and you just shoot a video. You walk down, you set up some control points um, for, you know, for the software later, the photogrammetry software. It says that's how you do your survey control. You just set up some, you know, points. So, but you just use a GoPro and you shoot a video and imagine you, you can even use your cell phone. You just shoot a video and then you export that video to the software and the software pro produces a 3D model of the oh. mine. So that takes away that whole survey process of like using a total station, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or a 3D scanner. Um, anyway, so I got there 
and this project was still in its infancy stages so there wasn't much work for me to do so i asked that i was working for the chief surveyor so i was like hey can i just hang out with the surveyors like i've done open pit surveying like i can help them i know they need help i i see like they they're short handed you know what i mean yeah maybe i can help so i was integrated in that team so i got to do underground surveying as well cool which is like a different ball game um but i was yeah so that's what i was doing project coordination and underground surveying um cool so now you got like yeah, a right. nice mix of experience some coal mining surveying uh go or sorry red lake was gold or in copper or just gold just gold just gold okay so, yeah. so underground um surveying and project management and then so that's already like 16 months of co-op and then you did another uh third term eight months with suncor was it that's right bro suncor? yeah and what did you do mm -hmm. at suncor so suncor was working in the long range mine planning team mm -hmm. um so some long range mine planning for one of the uh, assets in the in the in fort mcmurray uh, but anyway, so that's what I was doing. And that was long range planning. So, we're, and we're talking about 10 plus years uh, forward looking planning. Right. I mean, that's a long ways out. So it's not as exciting as short range planning. Um, so I've, uh, it was a good opportunity for me because like, you know, now I've spent time in short range planning, you know, mm -hmm. in survey and, you know, in surveying, you're shadowing and learning from also like the mind planners. So you're in the short range team pretty much. Um, you're learning from other people just because you have one job title doesn't mean like you're there to do a job you're there to learn as much as you can so take advantage you learn from everyone mm -hmm. um, around you so now I got to do long-range planning then so when I was in university in my final year I was like okay now I've gotten this experience I think I have an idea of what kind of jobs I can get when I graduate you know what I mean um, I've seen what kind of jobs there are out there at these companies so now I can I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in my final year and I'm thinking, you know, what, what did I enjoy? What didn't I enjoy? And I was like, okay, I want to, that's why I did, you know, when I was now applying for graduate uh, jobs after I graduate, I wasn't just applying for anything and everything, you know, during co-op, I was like, I'll apply for anything and everything. Yeah. Whoever's going to pay me, you know what I mean? Whoever, who I'm going to learn from, all of them are learning experiences. So it's like, who's yeah. the highest bidder? That's all that mattered. Who's the highest bidder? Man? <laughs> who's gonna, you know what I mean? But now after I graduate, I'm like, okay, now I know what jobs I like and what jobs I wouldn't like. So let me not waste my time. So, you know, and for me, one thing I did like is the short range world. Um, yeah. At least for me, as an early career, you know, short range, like it's fun, man. It's exciting. It's, you hardly get bored. Yeah, it's those, a lot uh, more fast paced. Yeah. Um, so before you even graduate, uh, one thing I want to ask about that I actually get a lot of questions about is like the financial aspects of um, tuition. What yeah. programs um, did you have access to that was able to uh, help fund, fund your tuition? Like student loans, scholarships, stuff like that. Can you dive a little bit deeper into those things? Yeah, for sure, man. Like for me, especially like financial support was a big component to my survival in university, man. For international students, Man, I don't know, depending for some, it's, the, first of all, for international students, tuition is like grossly significant than yeah. domestic students. It makes sense to me. I'm not complaining about that. I'm not trying to say domestic and international tuition should be the same. It shouldn't. <laughs> I understand. But it is expensive. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, just to give an idea, like UBC, it was average, let's just say 32,000 for my four years there. Um, and I wasn't even just there for four years, I was there for six years. So every year it's increasing. So if you, and that's one of the disadvantages with co-op, um, that one of the disadvantages with co-op is you spend more time in university. So you see a lot more, by the time you're graduating, you've paid a lot more, uh, a lot higher tuition than mm -hmm. people who finished in the four years. You know what I mean? Yeah. So plus also, even if you're in co-op, you're not enrolled in university, but you're still paying for university. To stay enrolled, you still have to pay some student dues, you know what I mean? Yeah. Paying for stuff that you never even know use. about or use. Yeah. As, so that's the game, that's the game. If you wanna stay, you gotta, <laughs> you know you what I mean? You gotta up. pay the taxes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you gotta pay taxes, man. So even when you're, 
and you're also paying co-op fees. Um, in fact, you know that's how the co-op student uh, program thrives. Is you pay taxes to them as well. You're like you're getting paid. Well, you know, yeah, that, that's human. I ain't complaining. That's how human society is. You gotta just everyone's gotta you know be fed. <laughs> Your success has gotta feed the community. That's that's all right. That's fair. But anyway, um, so for me, tuition was always a conversation. It was stress. Um, and so I was seeking multiple sources of uh, funding my tuition. And as an international student, the thing is, you're not eligible for government support, like government's school fees, not school fees, but rather subsidies or uh, rather government like uh, bursaries or grants, you know, government funded uh, tuition kickbacks. You're not eligible for none of that. So, and UBC is a public university. So UBC can't give you a scholarship. Uh, Wait, why is that? International. Or they can give you, now they give you entrance awards, but they don't give you like, cause it's government money. It's public money. Public money doesn't fund international stu tu oh. student tuition. So that's pretty much it. So, but now UBC as a university also has an endowment fund from private uh, donors. So they also have private money. They have public money and they have private money. So the private money is what that one can fund international students. And in the program, like in a um, faculty I was in, applied science, they get a, they also get like, you know, everyone gets uh, like a part of the budget. Everyone has a budget that they can use money. Um, so the Faculty of Applied Science, they had um, scholarships from private donors for international students. So the, there was somewhere you have to be a Canadian. There was somewhere, uh, as long as you pass this criteria, whether you're domestic or international, you can qualify for it. So those are the ones like I worked at earning and the like the ones I get, I got, so there's merit based and there's uh, need based, you know what I mean? So merit is like, you did good in school academically, so you get a scholarship. You're in the top percent of your class, so you get a scholarship. So those are the ones I mostly relied on. And there's others, there's need based. Um, need based is harder to prove need, but there's also need based um, private money that they give international students, you know what I mean? So. Those are the options available. And then also on the internet, there's private, you know, companies that have scholarships that you can apply for. So, you know, it's not just the scholarships in university, but there's also like just international programs and you just go to them, you know, an international company. Um, so. Well, I'm glad to hear there's a lot of like funding options for international students. Cause yeah, even as a domestic student myself, I, yeah, just some of the fees were like pretty significant. I guess, mm. yeah, for me, I was able to pay off my debt before I graduate, but I imagine mm. like for international students must be so much more harder just because everything you guys are paying for is just like that much more expensive. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I don't get into politics cause like, you know, for me that's, a, that's not my lane, but um, you know, there is a, political angle to um, being in university. And I think nowadays, what people are echoing when people talk about, oh, so-and-so didn't even graduate, dropped out of uni and became a billionaire, for example, it's, I think the only thing that's being echoed is you really, nowadays you just gotta think harder about why you wanna go to university. Like, is it worth it? Do, you do the math. You do the math and you're like, is it worth it? what you want to do do you even know what you want to do <laughs> you know first of all you got to know what you want to do that, that's what it comes down to as an international student or not even international you're right just any student going to uni whether international or domestic as long as it's not free you really should know what you're going to do there this country's where it's free it's like man you can just go but if it's not free then you ask yourself what am i going to do there and if, is it worth the money it's gonna cost? You know what I mean? So yeah, no, definitely yeah. agree. It's a it's a investment that you want to think about carefully before you actually put the money in. 
Uh, before right. we move on to the graduate portion, is there anything else you want to talk about, like your university experiences, academic experiences, or co-op experiences? Yeah. Um, anything people should know about, like, what makes UBC special? Um, what makes UBC special? Um, I'd just say, like, yeah. I'm here with my roommate, by the way. My roommate also went to UBC. All right. Um, yeah, yeah. We met after the fact, but uh, he also went to UBC. Um, but anyway, one thing I'd say about UBC is is just that, man, like opportunities. Opportunities is one of the best things. And it's not just UBC. Any university, one thing I learned, wherever you go, there's opportunities. Um, and just take advantage of the opportunity while you're in university. Um, in relation to co-op since you know this conversation also is about that is like for international students for any students i wouldn't even say international any students like it's best to be prepared for graduation don't wait till you graduate to be to start thinking about graduation what job you want to do um you know what i mean like co-op is a good way like i said i was able to learn what's out there what i like what i don't like and you know what I mean? You have that bargaining power and you learn those skills that prepare you. Like I said, going from high school to university is a is a huge step in, you know, aptitude uh, in aptitude learning. You know what I mean? Like it's for for a student, if you've been a student, you've gone from grade one to, you know, university. Now you should you look at co op is like that extra foundation you need before you graduate it prepares you for what's out there and then you'll know whether you're going to waste your time or not studying this thing yeah. so I, I encourage people to just go and co-op in whatever country you are there's different equivalents just get that industry experience while you have a chance you know so yeah i totally agree as well okay so uh you graduate you're, you're now reaching graduation you did what 24 months of co-op um but then you went to Imperial Oil as a uh, HEO, like a heavy equipment operator. And what was that like? Yeah, no, actually, so I was hired on as, when I was applying for the job, it was a, it's just new, new graduate engineer. Okay. You know what I mean? Recently graduated engineer. That was the job. The job title was just new hire engineer, literally. So what happens is they just hire, uh, you know, they put that job posting out, all the engineer, new hired, you know, recently graduated engineers or recent soon to graduate engineers apply. And then once they've hired the number of people they need, then they start allocating job roles. So that's how it worked at this company. So when I applied, I was just applying for a soon to graduate engineer job. Uh, so went through the whole process, took like six months and so by the time I was getting that, by the time my start date was coming, I was told that, okay, your job is now going to be engineer in operations is what they called it. So pretty much they have a program, a new program, they're testing it out. They're putting like a number of engineers for through like uh, embedding you in like the upstream production teams. So like the, you know, the, the shovel teams and the, uh, mine services teams, uh, you know, the production teams, the plant team, the tailings team, operations, the embedding engineers in operations. You know what I mean? Because engineers are in the technical team, but now they're sending them into the operations team where the field units are working so they can learn from them, from the shovels, from the trucks, from the dozers, the graders, you know what I mean? The mine services yeah. teams, the tailings operations teams. And then you take all that, then you go into your engineering role and, you know, add value with that information. So that's what the program was. And so that's why when I joined for the first 10 months, yeah, I was a heavy equipment operator. I was driving a 797 haul truck, which is uh, among the largest in the world. It's not the largest anymore, but it's among the largest and the best. You know what I mean? Caterpillar, yeah. big truck. Um, yeah. So you mentioned ten months, but uh, did the program specify that was ten months, or was it? Did it just happen to be ten months? Yeah, it just happened to be ten months. There was um, 
well it's it had specified that so they had a schedule of different roles that i needed to go through before getting into my engineering position so um even if it hadn't specified 10 months it took up to 10 months to go through uh, uh the the process of being in production so it was pretty much three seasons so i spent fall winter and spring in the in the team you know uh so that's pretty much like a full year cycle to see what it's like you know yeah i think and then the reason it also took t- 10 months is just because the company was also covid when covid hit oh. everything was in disarray so i started working like in the middle of covid like you know I, I signed the final contract right literally the week before covid i was in calgary you know the, everyone knows there was a specific time in like february when covid yeah. hits <laughs> so february 2020 so just a week before that i was in calgary and so i got hired right before covid if covid had hit any sooner i probably might not have gotten hired <laughs> you know what i mean yeah um, felt lucky though uh, uh blessed man it was just very fortunate you know blessed um so yeah so that so that happened um and so when i was joined the company it was just a disarray i didn't know it was going to be 10 months but it took a long time for things to process um and people to process there was a lot of restructuring um, so by the time I even my, I went through different supervisors, but, um, I even cut short that program, which was supposed to be like 12 months, but it ended up just being, you know, I, 10 I months. Yeah. Um, what was I going to ask? Um, forgot. <laughs> anyways, we'll move on. Um, so yeah. after the 10 months you became a, you work, you transfer to the reclamation department um and what was that experience like or first of all did you have to apply to it um or did they just automatically transfer you to um that position so the the position i was transferred into is uh, the title is water and reclamation uh planner so pretty much on i'm a short to mid-range planner for the water and reclamation team so the water team is, is separate from the reclamation team. They're both in Calgary. Um, so I was the water and reclamation. I am the water and reclamation planner. So I'm on both teams, water and reclamation on site. So I'm the only person from both teams on site. So that's why I'm like split between the two. The two teams needed someone on site. And this position is new and it was just formed to because of that gap in the in, in you know in both teams so it's a new role and um so i got transferred it, it popped up and you know they had to cut cut short my um training mm-hmm. or rather my period in operation so i can start that role because they were just they were aching they needed right. someone the business so needs. they just pulled us yeah the business needs like yeah so they cut short the program so we could myself and the other you know uh person that made it uh through that in the beginning we were four and then covid and people's personal decisions we ended up being two of us who finished the program um so we both got that role rotating because we're on different shift rotations so we're both in the same role gotcha Um, I just remember yeah. where'd you I, get this info from? Did you get it from my LinkedIn? I, I, yeah, I looked at looked at oh. your LinkedIn. I gotta be, pre- <laughs> be prepared, <laughs> so I know how to yeah, like structure yeah, yeah. the interview. Yeah, yeah, you've done your research. I even forgot that I might have already updated that on LinkedIn, man. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice, man, investigator. <laughs> yeah, I, I just remembered um, what I wanted to say earlier. Um, basically, just for the viewers, but um, at least for oil sands company, I know this is more common now where like for a new grad EITs that they'll start them off on like haul truck or like um, operations first um, before they get transferred into technical department so haul trucks or whatever like maybe even though I think it's mainly haul trucks but then they do that first for I think roughly around a year before they get moved into like short range planning or mid range whatever it may be so just for note for the viewers out there um, the other question actually I have, if if yeah. I can even add on top of that man so for me 
so I've told you about my co-op experience, right? Yeah. During my co-op experience, um, I didn't have this opportunity. This is one opportunity that I was like, I wish I had when I was graduating. I was, I was like, I wish I had this opportunity. I found out I'll be an engineer in operations literally two weeks before I started the job. So the whole time I thought I was just going straight into the engineering team in Calgary. No, okay, I knew I was going to be on site, but I didn't. I thought it was just going to be an engineering job on site straight away. So when I graduated, I was like, you know, if there was one opportunity I wish I had, it was like in operations as a whole truck driver or, you know what I mean, like um, as a dozer operator or, you know, in, driving some equipment to learn in the field, you know what I mean? So this was a really good opportunity that popped up after the fact. And I'm like, if I could, I would have even stayed longer because other companies, or maybe not longer, but other companies from what I hear, they even put fresh engineers in like dozers, bulldozers, mm -hmm. maybe even a grader, an excavator. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just something small because those, those are big toys as well. You, you have to have years of experience to drive the bigger ones. Right. But the smaller ones that you can just train someone, you know, quickly and they can do it um so that was a good opportunity and man you're like from what i from my own experience if you have that opportunity to like do a co-op where you're driving a truck or driving some piece of equipment take advantage of that man because you're not going to be doing that you're an engineer you're not going to get that chance again mm -hmm. but it helps you relate very well with those operators in the field and with that equipment capability it helps in your planning decisions in your plan when you're planning work you understand how that thing works how long it'll take to do this if it'll even be able to hit this design as per the specs you've given right um so it's good experience you, you don't have to but it's good experience uh, yeah for sure 100 yeah. percent agree um so okay i think we've covered almost everything we went through your, your background in kenya your education co-op um so your new grad experiences Actually, one thing I want to touch on is um, you mentioned you worked on site. And you also mentioned shift work. Um, what were the shifts that you were working on and how was that experience like? Yeah, um, so for example, right now what I'm working is 14 days on, 14 days off. So for 14 days, um, you you know, they pay for your flight from um, either Calgary or Edmonton like the company I'm at, there's a flight hub. So fr from here, I get on a plane, I go somewhere for 14 days, and then I come back home. And then for I'm home for 14 days. So uh, there's different schedules uh, out there in the industry, there's seven and seven, there's 10 and 10. Um, like when I was a co-op student at tech, I did four and three. So f you work four days, like pretty much like 12 hour shifts, and then you get three days off, so a three day weekend. Um, and it's that 12 hour shift that when you do the math compared to someone doing a nine to five or an eight to four, you're, you're doing the equivalent of hours for those days. You know what I mean? So you're pretty much working more or less the same number of hours, if not slightly more in a, in a month than someone else who's doing Monday to Friday, really. Right. Um, so yeah. Were, and so I, go ahead, man. Were you doing uh 12 hour days for your seven and seven or sorry, 14, 14? 14, 14 and 14 is 12 hours days, yeah. So you do 14 times 12, you know, uh, quick math, I think it's 169 or 196 hours, um, 169 maybe. And that's like, if you do eight to, eight to five, someone who works Monday to Friday in the office, two day weekend, it's more or less the same hours. But because you're doing it for 12 hours, 14 days straight, it's like, right. Uh, and then you get 14 days off. So that's the math. When I was in tech, I was saying I did four three. When I was in Red Lake, I did four four. Um, so different companies have different ones. Um, yeah. So good to know. Good to know. I only did. Mm -hmm. I only ever did the uh, standard five and two. So never really had yeah. a chance to experience shift work. Um, yeah. Okay. So I think we've covered almost pretty much everything. But uh, was there anything else that I was missing that you want to talk about? stuff that you want to share with the audience yeah i was gonna like one thing i can't say you know like i i said like when before you graduate you know if you can get industry experience 
you know, one thing I'd say after you graduate, um, you know, for me, honestly, co-op gave me an advantage. It gave me an advantage because I already had a resume that was appealing to the companies I was applying to. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when you graduate, it's tough. Co-op gives you not even just co-op. It's not just co-op. It's industry experience. If you have something on your resume that says you worked for a company similar to the one you're trying to apply to uh, as an intern, uh, they take that seriously. Um, so you have a better opportunity. You have a better competitive edge than other people who haven't had industry experience. So at the end of the day, what I was going to say is, okay, if you don't get the job you want, don't 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 let that get you down. Just take any job, <laughs> okay? Take any job and just start somewhere. Very okay, good. don't wait for Facebook to hit you back or, <laughs> or for Tesla. Like, just take any job. Take any job. Just build a resume and then learn the skills. And then these opportunities, opportunities will always be there, but you got to be prepared. Um, so, you know, it's those, those two combinations of opportunity and preparation. You got to be prepared. So I was, you know, prepared. And that's why I said, well, I could pick and choose which job I want to do for real. I actually had that opportunity to I had some offers and I picked and choose what I want, uh, pick, picked and chose what I wanted to do. But if you don't have that opportunity, man, just take any job and then be, do the best you can at it. And these opportunities will pop up. Boom. You have a resume. Um, now you can start picking and choosing what jobs you want. You can start like negotiating your pay um, and other work terms. You know what I mean? So I was going to say that um, a lot of people would rather like just think, you know, let me just wait till a job opening pops up. One that I want to, one that I want to do. No, get out of your comfort zone. Do one that you need to do, you know, not just one that you want to do. Yeah, very good advice that I would echo as well. Um, so what's next for you, Eric, like career wise, um, where do you think you're headed down? My initial plan when I came to, you know, a vision I've had and a plan I've had that I'm still working towards is I want to, I came to Canada so I can learn from the best. I want to learn from the best mining companies in the world, but I want to take this, uh, the knowledge and the experience I gain, I want to import that to Kenya and work on the mining industry there because that's my home man so i definitely want to go back home i love it and uh there's a lot of room for development and where there's room for development there's room to make money so it's kind of selfish as well man i want to go and make a lot of money so well I doing learn so you're going to help a lot of other the, people make money yes. yeah yeah that's i think you make money if you're making money the right way it's because you're adding value yeah you're either selling a product or service which people need so, I mean, for me, there's a lot, I see a lot of need in, cause like even in Kenya right now, um, my dad uh, passed on a business um, to the family for, um, we train engineers and, you know, university students and professional engineers and even just graduate engineers. We train them in uh, CAD and BIM software mm -hmm. in Kenya. So we have training schools, we sell software, we resell software to companies and individuals, we train them. Um, and not only that, but for me, my vision for that company is to, and I've already started is um, also like upselling technology. So things like uh, drones for survey, that's like something, it's a concept we're selling and implementing for customers in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's the vision is to you know, I want to go back to Kenya and work in building the mining industry there, but also like just uh, building the engineering industry, you know what I mean, um, in the private sector. So that's my goal. When, I don't know when, it's it's a long-term plan. So I had a 10-year plan, it's within the 10-year plan, but between now and then I'm out here, I work at a good company, so I want to get as much experience as I can. I can see different positions that I want to, be in that will help me see that bigger vision of going back to Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's a good company. When you find somewhere, you know, something I read somewhere is grow where you're planted. And we live like, I mean, maybe, I mean, and I, I don't know, I haven't lived long enough to say conclusively, but in every economy, there's ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And so like right now in the, the industry I'm at, 
there's a lot of attrition. You have a lot of engineers leaving their Olsons, uh, or rather leaving their companies for whatever reason, you know, better opportunities. I think that's the only reason you want to leave a company, right? Mm -hmm. uh, better opportunity or peace of mind. It's one of the two. Either it's for your health or for your wealth. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, those are the only reasons people really, I think, leave companies. Um, so mental health is a part of the health. You know what I mean? Um, so, but grow where you're planted. You know what I mean? You don't have to, you know, if like, you know, you don't, you don't want to like be so concrete in your career plans to miss opportunities for achieving that same ends by a different means. You know what I mean? So maybe you want to be CEO of a company, but that doesn't mean you don't have to go through the foundational jobs to get there. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so grow where you're planted and then learn the most. So like in, in, from my, um, the people ask yourself with the company I'm at and my roommate, we talk about this, his company as well, cause it's in the Olsons. Um, you know, you work with a lot of experienced people, um, and people are like, you know, three years, three to four years max in a row, you know, in three to four years, you've learned something, you know what I mean? So pretty much it's like, yeah, don't, don't just do something for a year and then you want to do something else. You know what I mean? Um, take your time three to four years is that's also an average I could go with three to four years in a row. Um, it's pretty, it's good for experience. So if you want to do like three, four roles, that's already 10 years experience. You know what I mean? You're an expert. So that's, that's some advice I've learned and I'd pass on for sure to other people. Well, Eric, it's been almost an hour of, and I just want to thank you so much for sharing all the value bombs here. Uh, lots of good advice and just thank you so much for sharing your experiences to all the prospective viewers and prospective mining engineers. Um, one last thing, feel free to plug yourselves on your so, um, all your socials if, if people want to find more about you. Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Kwan. Um, uh, we've been meaning to do this. I'm like, this is really cool, man. Like, I like mining. Um, I like mining. Talking mining, you know, mining, money, it all sounds the same. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's they're both exciting. But um, this is a really dope podcast. And, uh, you know, thanks for having me. And, you know, one thing I want to say is, um, for me, I also like to tell people, like, you know, okay, you know, career doesn't have to be one thing. Okay, you want to be a mining engineer? Don't, don't be defined by your job, man. You know, be someone in life. Do other things. So, like, for me, like, for you, you're doing this podcast, you know, just, you're a mining engineer, right? Yeah. Um, so, you're, you're not just, that's not who you are. That's what you do. But, like, who you are, you see, you're Kwan, you also do this podcast. So for me also, like, I do other things besides the mining. And one thing I do is music. That's what I'm into. So I'm going to plug the music as well, The Afrolution. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's The Afrolution. That's two separate words. T-H-E and Afrolution, A-F-R-O-L-U-T-I-O-N. So I make music. I think of it as po poetic rap. So check it out. Um, I have a YouTube page. I'm on Spotify. I'm on Apple Music, whatever music platform you use to stream your music uh bless up check it out check out my ig same thing the afrolution afrolution i'm sure kwan's gonna put it in the description wherever you post yeah. this and um yeah man check me out hit me up instagram facebook if you have any questions linkedin eric showery so that's uh first name dot you know first name last name c-a-u-r-i so check me out and let's connect man you know let's network uh, I like to learn from people, so you know, I'd love to learn from other people. And uh, who knows, man, we might do a part two. You know, next time I'll interview you, man, because like I don't know if you've you tell your stories in your interviews, but you haven't been interviewed, you know. So yeah, love to hear your story, man. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Eric. Um, and I'll stop the recording here.